Welcome everyone. Um, this event is brought to you by Data Docs Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events. This is one of such events. Actually, this week we have four events, so which is quite unusual. And the reason for that is because I will be off in July in the entire month. So that's why we kind of buffer the events. So then we will be releasing them one by one uh, each week. So anyways, we have quite a few of them. Go check it out, uh, register for the ones you like. There is a link in the description. Then subscribe for our YouTube channel if you haven't done this. I think more than 50% of people who watch these videos do not subscribe for whatever reasons. I see no reason not to subscribe. So do this now and you'll get notified about all our streams and videos. And finally, we have an amazing Slack community. So check it out. You can hang out with other data folks. During today's interview, you can ask any question you want. There is a link in the description. So it's pinned link, uh, in, not in the description, sorry, in live chat. It's pinned, so click on this link and ask your questions. And I will be covering these questions during the interview. I think that's all I wanted to say. Now I will stop sharing my screen. I will get the questions I prepared for you, Olga. OK, yes, now I have them. Sure. Okay, um, just one second. Um, my Zoom looks weird. Okay, now it's all good. Um, are you ready to start? I believe so. Okay, so this week, this week we'll talk about hiring data scientists. And we have a special guest today, Olga. Olga is a delivery director, delivery data science director at Microsoft. Olga has worked in AI for over 16 years. She's worked in different roles from researcher to product manager to people manager. And as a director, she's quite involved in hiring data scientists. So we invited her to talk more about this. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. And before we go into our main topic of hiring data scientists, let's start with your background. Can you tell us about your career journey so far? Right. Um, I started really early with uh, what you would refer to as data science. Uh, so um, I was about 18 when I was studying at the university and uh, I was studying applied mathematics. And then of all of the subject mathematics, statistics is, was basically something that got me fascinated right away because it made sense of all of the other things. It was something which was more the most tangible. And then I discovered a lot of uses of statistics. I was also very, very lucky to have a uh, great lecturers and great professors along the way. So I, I think it's also to the importance of having great teachers in your life. So I was really lucky. And then I kind of stuck with this since then. My first job was uh, in 2006. I was working for a um, small consulting company, boutique consulting company, doing forecasting of box office revenues of motion pictures. Uh, the model, I think, or at least the approach, not definitely evolved, but the approach, I think, is still in use by, well, the subsequent derivation of that company today. Then I worked for a mogul in telecommunications doing the very classical use case in telecommunication, which is called trend prediction. And then I decided to pursue my PhD. No, first I think it was my master's and then it was my PhD. All of the stuff that I've done was also kind of applied statistics, machine learning. Uh, yeah, and then I worked in a bunch of places, five different countries, startup setting, freelance, uh, yeah, but more consulting uh, and now a very large, I think the best in the world software company. <laughs> but um, Seamless right, I think, I, think um, I have always done things which have to do with financial services mostly uh, or health. So basically, if you put them together, it's well-being with a small kind of exception. I've spent two and a half years working for an airline. It was very romantic time. I was living in the airport. It was incredible. And uh, yeah, I do not regret it in the slightest. It was really kind of a little bit of, kind of a separate experience. But it was really great. What did you do there? Also related to data science forecasting or something else? Yeah, it's a German airline, which you might know. 
yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, and I was working there first as a lead data scientist, and then I was uh -huh. working there, uh, basically not, not as part of the airline, but in, in consulting company, which was working with the airlines that was Deloitte. Mm -hmm. for. And um, yeah, leading AI projects, initiatives, and uh, helping create personalized flight experiences. So you did PhD, you worked with a startup, then you freelanced, then you joined a consultancy company, and now you work uh, in a corporation. That's like you tried everything, right? I also did a postdoc. It was also always a dream oh. of mine. It's something that many PhDs want to do. Sometimes they want to do it for a reason that they cannot explain to themselves. So Alexei, I also told you, I think, while we we're talking about preparation of this call, that one of the um podcast that you have made really moved me and motivated me to uh speak which was about the transition from academia to uh industry and this is also a story of my life as which is as, as well as many other lives and this is why you know if you have done a phd you want to do a postdoc you consider this you do not really know why you just want it and you go for it. So it was it was a story of my life. I do not regret it in the slightest. I'm still friends with all of the people I used to work with. And uh, yeah, it was a fantastic experience. <laughs> and uh, by the way, check it out. This uh, the episode that I was talking about was with CJ, uh, CJ Jenkins, I think. Uh, and it was called From Academia to Data Science, was it? But yeah. I think it was uh, like a couple of, couple of seasons ago. Check it out. That was indeed a cool one. And uh, what uh, was your PhD about? Um, it was about the uh, application of machine learning to assess air pollution. It was in the metropolitan region of Barcelona, uh, precisely. And this is important because of, uh, you know, you could have many diseases that could be linked to certain levels of air pollution. So they're not directly related, but they could be potentially linked. I think it's kind of, sorry, kind of a little bit of common sense. That uh, if you have highly polluted areas, the propensity of you, you know, basically somebody getting get nil is is higher. Uh, so the idea was to create a measurement method to be able to uh, come up with a kind of pollution surface, or to be able to essentially precisely estimate uh, the level of air pollution at a given point and thus be able to say what have would have been the estimate of air pollution at a certain place. And the strengths of this was one of the interesting methods, which is called conformal predictions, is that instead of giving you a point estimate, it would give you an interval, uh, but it would be a very, uh, how to say this, very valid and very reliable estimate. So, and the more data you have, obviously, the narrower your interval is. So, uh, was yeah. it something related to Bayesian statistics, where you get uh, distribution? You could do that as well, but not necessarily. Yes, there was some parts of uh, underlying methods that use the Bayesian. Bayesian. Sorry, I haven't used the word in seventy-five years. Inference, <laughs> but um, but um, frequentist as well. So it didn't really have to be. Okay. Yeah, and uh, what do you do now, if you can tell us? What I do now, yeah. uh, I lead a team of people who is much smarter than I am, much more intelligent and much more advanced in modern technologies, uh, in, in modern data science, much better versed. So uh, try to support them on um, their way towards um, supporting our customers and uh, making a positive impact and especially positive business impact working with our customers. I mean, the customers of Microsoft are obviously uh, very important. And uh, we also work, I don't really, you know, I'm kind of, I'm on this podcast today as me, not as a representation of my company. So everything I say, I have to say, this is my own opinion and does not necessarily mm -hmm. uh, reflect or does not necessarily, you know, somehow match the opinion of my employer, but I'm very proud to work there. I have to say, because we really, I mean, you know, our motto is to empower every person, every organization on the planet to achieve more. And I'm just fascinated by how we work with, uh, you know, different sizes of organizations from moguls, corporations, Forbes S500, so Forbes, sorry, 500 list up to uh, startups, essentially. So uh, 
I have people in my team who, and me included, but I don't really spend enough time on this as much as I would want to, is to support startup founders and also female founders. We have a program which is called Microsoft for Startups. So this is also something which is quite cool. But going back to what I do as well is, uh, yeah, essentially supporting my team in uh, driving the best and the most meaningful business outcomes for our customers with data science, as well as I'm responsible for business development in specific regions in EMEA. Yeah, and to help drive technology innovation, essentially, and to do the right thing with AI. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I mentioned, you're involved in hiding, right? That's why, that's why we have this yes. conversation today. Yes, actually, I have been involved in hiring for the last, I would say, seven years. So mm-hmm. I've been hiring data scientists about about seven years time. So it's not has been a it's not have been a small journey really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, just since you mentioned that, I'm really curious how the definition of a data scientist changed over these seven years. Was it was it the same seven years ago, or now the data scientists you hire are completely different from the data scientists you hired seven years ago? Uh, it depends, Alexei, because obviously if you hire senior people, they are from before. I think they are mammoth, like you and I, who started studying. Yeah, thank you. There's no such thing as data science. So my, my newest hire, they graduated from data science programs, which are formally called data science programs. When I started, there was no such thing. So I, I studied applied statistics, you know. What did you study, by the way? Information technologies. You see, so there are so many different walks of life from where people come Mm -hmm. uh, to become data scientists, you know, physics, all flavors of engineering, neuroscience, you know, many social sciences as well. So, uh, yeah, I think that sometime, so basically seven years ago, there was a little bit of a kind of more, less expectations, let's put it that way, less, less expectations around what a data scientist would do uh but i guess what has stayed invariant is um kind of pursuit of excellence to be honest because of a great data scientist back then is still a greater scientist now and uh yeah you got you could have been excellent seven years ago and you could be still excellent or you could be excellent now if it makes sense uh, the, the thing i observed maybe it's uh, just well, the, my sample size is a bit biased, but what I saw is now there is more emphasis on the engineering aspect of data science. And seven years ago, eight years ago, the, uh, the focus was more on mathematics and uh, the, the mathematics behind machine learning. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is at least what I observed. Uh, but uh, again, I myself was mo- moving more into the engineering direction. That's why maybe like just things around me uh, changed, but not the uh, environment, let's say. Right, I would agree with that uh, because of, I think that five, seven years ago, we didn't have the infrastructures really to deploy, mm-hmm. or for instance, we couldn't be even speaking about MLOps because we didn't really have infrastructures to operationalize whatever. So we were trying, you know, actually the notion of data science is really, really old. If you think about, so for instance, very, I mean, let's leave alone academia because they have been doing this forever, you know, kind of analyzing data and uh, coming up with inference based on that. But if we look into the industry, for instance, this really old industry such as uh, insurance or for instance, banking, they have had their quant desks, they have had their uh, analytics desks, they have had their actuarial practitioners for very, very long time, de- decades. Like uh, 50 years, right? For 50 years or yeah. like 30 years for sure. Longer maybe. than that. So yeah. the thing is that, the thing is that, to be honest, I mean, what they do in data science, absolutely. Were they putting it into broad? Not really. So, I mean, I remember seven years ago, there was a lot of use cases deployed on a local machine. This is true. But um, nowadays, it's definitely the growth of computational technologies and the rise of cloud, which, you know, kind of, I think, boosted the whole thing. And I agree with you. There is now a lot of focus on engineering. And also my honest opinion is that it takes a village to deliver AI sustainably. It's just not one person who knows like a bunch of algorithms, to be honest. Mm -hmm. 
And when now, when you are hiring data scientists, when you are looking for a data scientist, what are the qualities you are looking for typically? There are two things which are very, very important. So we are always, and this prevails. It's 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 true. It's true for me. So it was true for me as I'm a hiring manager in my current job. It was true for me when I was working for uh, another company. Um, two things essentially, which are pivotal for me. One is technical skills. They have to be excellent, really, really. So this is something that you really need to bring your hard skills with you. You really have to work on them if you are feeling that you're not quite there. There is no reason for you not to get there. It's all the matter of practice and studying. Oh, what do you mean by excellent technical skills? Like maybe can you give an example? Because like great Python knowledge, ability to solve different algorithmic uh, challenges or... That's a great question. So what I mean by great technical skills is essentially how to say this, you know, if you're a professional chef, you know that you're good. <laughs> okay. You obviously know how to chop an onion very, very well, but you also know how to create masterpieces with it. So what I'm trying to say is that essentially for me, excellence, and I think it's something which cannot be catalogized or you cannot really put a definition on that. But for me, it manifests in understanding very, very deeply what you do. So for me, uh, an excellent data scientist kind of stands what the, what the solution does on the level of underlying algorithm. They can really, you know, kind of plot it, write it, uh, describe it with mathematical formula on a piece of paper. It could, they could explain in very, very simple what, what it actually does and how it does it. And what would be the underlying assumptions on data? What would be the risk? So, you know, one of my favorite interview questions, for instance, which I ask a lot of people, uh, is uh, what does it mean? What does it mean of the data? Uh, you know, you know, it, it sounds, you know, it sounds sounds very, very kind of obvious. But try it, and you will see so many interesting answers to that. And it gives you a lot of, a lot of kind of how to say, background of how people actually feel what they do. Then another thing which is very, very important for excellence is uh, well, essentially practice. So you have to have a passion for this, because if you don't have a passion for this, you will not be able to practice this over a long time. And how they say practice makes perfect. There is no other way. I mean, there is no degree of talent in my in my experience that will compensate for lack of practice. You know, and it's something has to drive you forward. I mean, it's obviously discipline, but it's also practice. So yeah, through practice, thorough understanding of what the thing does, and constant learning, you eventually achieve excellence. Mm -hmm. I guess this is pretty subjective. And when, yeah. but when hiring, you want to be objective, right? So how do you check if this person really has this deep understanding of what they do? Uh, I guess you just ask questions. Hey, what, what do you do? Can you explain me? Right? right. So do you mind if I answer about the second aspect of what I'm looking? Because you said you, you asked me about what are yeah, those yeah, things please. So the first one the was second, technical, right? And the second? Uh, attitude. Attitude. Okay. Yeah. That's, I think, equally important or the mm -hmm. most important thing is the attitude. Mm -hmm. You have to be a constant learner. You have to know your worth. You have to be humble. You have to, you know, love it, really. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah. know, I mean, know precisely or at least be honest with yourself where you go into and what you're going to do there. Try to find as much as possible. So is, are you going to work in a product? Are you going to work for the customers? Are you going to work deeply in research? And then, you know, kind of have the right approach to that. <laughs> so how do you check love? How do you check love, sorry? They, you said uh, like attitude is important and people should love what they do. Right? Yeah. So how do you check if they actually love? Oh, they it are shows not there how for the money. It. it shows. Right. It absolutely shows. I mean, passion is something that you cannot really conceal. Can you like maybe mention uh, like how we can manifest when you see that the candidate doesn't have this attitude or doesn't have this love you talked about well i think and again you absolutely right it's very subjective i don't i'm not i'm not like a guidebook on hiring to be honest i'm a bunch of my I'm, I'm curious. experiences like you don't have to promise you, promise you a fair share of those experiences potentially some views which will be corrected over time because i'm wrong very often and then like every human person and also it's mm -hmm. a collection of uh, mistakes that i have made 
But what is true for me nowadays, I think, how do you check for attitude? I think you would ask about what I would do. I would ask about motivation. Why do you do data science? Mm -hmm. I mean, potentially not so directly, but you can ask a bunch of questions around this to understand what is a person's motivation to go to their field. Mm -hmm. You know, so it would be behavioral questions like, tell me about the time you did something, right? These mm -hmm. kind of questions. Let me try it. So, Alexei, why are you into data science? What, what makes you what makes you do this podcast? Okay, <laughs> I was not prepared <laughs> for that. I guess meeting people, like if we are talking about this specific podcast, yeah. like meeting people and learning from them, learn, learning from you. So right now, I'm actually uh, taking notes. So those who have uh, watched it in a video, not listening, I'm showing now the notes I'm making. And then after this episode, there will be a transcription. So I can go through this transcription and really learn this again and again. So this is super useful. So with every episode, with every guest, I learn something new. So I guess that's uh, one of the motivations why I keep Perfect. doing it. That sounds but really great. Your question was about data science, right? I'm still not done. Do you mind if I if yeah. I um, if I dig yeah, a little please. bit little bit deeper? So yeah. uh, of the of the episodes that you have conducted with your guests, what resonates most? What has I mean doesn't necessarily has to apply to people, the topics, the things. What I mean, if I would ask you, potentially wake you up in the middle of the night and say, Alexei, what has been or what have been the most interesting topics or that have been the most important to you? That have been discussed here what those have been yeah usually those are around career like more soft topics rather than hard topics not topics about mm, like how gpt3 works but more like uh, like how you progress in your career like why are you doing what you do or how you became mm, like what you are right now like the career trajectory different roles uh, so this is the kind of stuff i really like mm -hmm. uh, one of the recent ones uh, were like for example yesterday i interviewed a person about his experience of becoming a founder a company founder so he yeah. was hacking uh, like he was creating open source and became a founder so these are the kind of episodes i really love awesome that sounds really really good and uh, the last question around this what, what have you learned doing this exercise this podcast what is that you have learned about people about data scientists about the human aspect uh, that is a pretty broad question i don't know yeah. how to answer that. <laughs> but the most important thing that's you know kind of the sticks mm, people are interesting everyone is different um, yeah and everyone has a story to tell yeah. and it's funny when i reach out to people say hey do you want to be on the podcast and some of them say, yeah, but there is nothing I can talk about. But then it's like the best podcast episode. Right. And then another the almost last question, because I also know that you have a day job as a principal data scientist. Uh -huh. On your reading list, the, the stuff that you're reading right now, what what is the most prominent source of where you get the news about the latest updates on data science? Yeah, Twitter, I guess. So mm -hmm. I check Twitter and then if something gets a lot of uh, exposure on Twitter, I look into this. But usually these are topics more around uh, engineering aspect of data science rather than, uh, you know, the latest trends in AI. I, right. of course, uh, played with DALE. It was fun. Like I tried uh, different prompts. You know what DALE is, right? So mm -hmm. you, you give it a prompt and then it generates like six, uh, nine pictures. So I was trying weird stuff like uh, uh, like well, the guy from KFC is Colonel Sanders, right? This, you know, this guy. Um, he's from like the on the logo of KFC, like this fast food chain. So I was trying things like uh, Colon Colonel Sanders has is having a Zoom call with puppies to take over McDonald's, and then it would generate random pictures. So that was fun. But yeah, the, I am just playing with this kind of stuff. But I I am reading more about like engineering stuff. Yeah. I see. And this is why you, this is, I, I infer, probably because you have more passion for the engineering aspect of data science rather than the algorithmic one. Okay. And this is Can what you, you said, that everybody is different because some people like myself, for instance, would be more driven to potentially, I mean, I'm very much into technological development, but I'm very much the first thing when I read about the new technology, the first thing that I try to infer for myself is how it works under the hood. So what is mm -hmm. the underlying method? So today when you said Bayesian, I was like, oh my God, because you know, in 
potentially the level of conversations that I normally have in my daily job, I do not often get asked about it. And that's a shame. I mean, I should probably work, I've made learning to myself that I probably should uh, have more such conversations because I really, really love that. Mm -hmm. I just remember from my university days, when you have point estimate, it's a uh, frequentist approach, but when you have a distribution that's Bayesian, that's why I thought, okay, like, let me show I'm smart too. <laughs> you are. <laughs> you officially a stamp of approval. <laughs> I think I asked you a question which you kind of, hmm, because like we were talking about two things that you look at, technical skills and then attitude, right? And then I think both of these things are kind of hard to measure. They are more subjective, but there must be some objective way to measure this, right? So attitude is more like what you just tried on me, right? Asking the, these questions. Uh, what about technical skills? Like, do you also do this by asking questions like, hey, tell me about the project you did? Uh... Yeah, you know, the thing that I have to be honest with you, I have had many, 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 many interviews in my life. So uh, this is something that you eventually, it's like muscle training. You get a lot of uh, intuition just based on the experience that you would have had. And uh, like yourself, I uh, very much like getting to know people. So for me, always the interview process is an opportunity also for me to learn from another person where they come from, what they have learned. And every time, every time I have an interview, I learn something new. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. I think it's the most rewarding activity that you can do but um i would be very cautious answering your question because i you definitely do have objective criteria and you have to have objective criteria it's it's absolutely mandatory and i will elaborate on that in a second however you must not forget that you deal with people and people are not necessarily always objective so I think one of the fallacies of the data scientists with or generally any technical people, I think, who move into more kind of a softish discipline is not to forget that you actually deal with people and not to expect them to follow, you know, kind of a blueprint or kind of a, if this, then that approach. It's with human beings mm -hmm. utterly wrong. At least I think so. Mm -hmm. But on objective criteria. So, for instance, for me, it has always been very important to conduct a technical interview. You could have different shapes of form of that. It could have, you know, kind of some code exercise. It could have some, you know, kind of analytical exercise as well. And then you would ask a bunch of questions. One of them is, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it will also help you understand very many things about the depth of somebody's knowledge. And then you potentially for specific things, you also, I think one of the things that you need to also remind yourself of, or at least I, when I interview, is to stay humble and not kind of dig into places where I know stuff. Because if I can ask somebody if, like, do there, are, are there any kind of distributions that wouldn't have like a mean, and then get a person completely lost and frustrated during the interview. But I mean, I also have in mind why I'm asking this question. So what do I want to test? What, what do I expect this person to be able to do to be successful on this job? You know, so this is important as well. So kind of also to prepare for your technical interviews and be very meaningful about what are you asking and also at all the times respectful. So are there distributions that do not have a mean? Yeah. Sorry, I probably shouldn't have asked <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> like what are those uh, distributions i invite you to check wikipedia <laughs> <laughs> what was the most interesting <laughs> answer you got when you asked uh, about the mean the most interesting answer yeah okay because i would just answer it's average right just to, you know dot mean and do you, do you do you really want to go there I'm just uh, <laughs> All right. No, but I mean, interesting answer. So I think when you say interesting, you mean something that has stuck with uh, me, the reply, right? Unusual, something you remember, yes. Yeah. So I remember a person who we hired answered on that question. And they, sorry, answered that question. And they were very specific in their answer because they also, you know, kind of, they ex give, they have given kind of a textbook definition of a mean or an average of the data they have provided an example of potentially how you measure this in a sample uh, they have provided an example of how it extrapolates to whatever population you would 
take the sample from. And then they have a, provided a practical example of uh, how this applies to life. You know, this was really, really good. It was really impressive for me. And uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, that's pretty the, expensive. The depths of the knowledge. You know, for instance, one of the ways, for instance, how you could ask about me now, for instance, if you're still not convinced with my favorite question, is a, um, you could ask somebody, let's assume you want to move to a new country, which you know nothing about. And like their, for instance, their currency also says nothing to you. I mean, you can obviously check it at places like xe.com, but I mean, you would not live it, and it will be no kind of something which, you know, kind of will be natural to you to operate in, 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 this, in this environment. And then you would want to buy or rent a house. And then you would definitely want to know for potentially you would check neighborhood and stuff like that. You would want to know the average level of prices, you know, in this neighborhood or in this country. So basically what would be the main statistics? What would be the, the mean essentially? And what would be the deviations of that and stuff like that? So in a human level, that makes a lot of sense, right? To, be, to, 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 know, to know why you want to know this. Mm -hmm. And this gives you an understanding essentially, essentially why you want to know this and what this means. And how it translates. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. You know, one um, of the things also, maybe it's because I want to start a session. One of the things is that people very much kind of talk about predictive statistics and like cognitive, whatnot, prescriptive. This is very, very important, definitely. But one should not underestimate the power of descriptive statistics. It's when you know when I studied mathematics, they told me it's elemental, not because it's simple. It's elemental because it's their elements from which other more complex things are constructed. So and descriptive statistics is uh, like all this mean, uh, median, all this kind of uh, characteristics of data of the sample you have, right? Descriptive statistics are the statistics that describe the data. Okay. Yeah, my statistics is a bit rusty. So I know how to fit and predict in scikit-learn, but <laughs> if you start dangerous, asking dangerous. statistical questions... You yeah. should be able to understand what the data tells before... Yeah, before. I'll um, take a refresher, I guess, after <laughs> this conversation. Yeah, well, honestly, but... I, I take it all the time because I forget stuff. And then when I have the time, I would just read old books. Like, for instance, Hasti Tipshiriani, The Elements of Statistical Learning. I think it's... Oh, that's a good one. I have it. It's a very good one. Okay, so we since we talked a bit about statistics and math, so what do you think? What is more important, strong, math, strong mathematical background or strong engineering background when we hire people, or we just hire both, or how do we decide? Mm -hmm. That's a very, very interesting question. Uh, I think it depends on what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. But let's say you have a team and you want to hire data scientists for the team. And you have some objective, like there is a product, you want to add artificial intelligence, machine learning to this product, and now you have a task to hire three data scientists, right? So how do you decide if you want to get people with who has a stronger mathematical background or who are more like stronger engineers, let's say? You know, when I hire my data scientists, I need to, or I need to be able to very, very disambiguously know what I want them to do. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, just today we have had a team meeting and we discussed things that are scope of data science work recently because of its emerging discipline still. It's been very broad and it doesn't always, you know, play as a favor for data scientists because of, uh, you know, in, in German, there is a concept of kind of Eierliegende Wollmilchsau, you know, kind of a, it's a very interesting animal. So it's essentially a pig, which also gives wool and also gives milk and also gives eggs, you know. So we should avoid having a data. I mean, you more polite way to call this is a Swiss army knife. Mm -hmm. But none of them actually, or, or another way to call it is jack of all trades. But being that person is really no fun, honestly, you know. And this is kind of also difficulty to kind of retain somebody like this for in the long run because if you kind of expect the person to be able to do everything and say yeah whatever you you can so you have to so it's not necessarily not necessarily fun to be that person mm -hmm. okay so you have to be very very specific when you want to hire data scientists you have to be very very specific what do you expect them to actually do mm -hmm. 
Okay. And if this, uh, if what you expect is integrating with the backend of whatever the, the existing team is doing, then it's probably more engineering. But if you expect them to do more analytics, uh, more talking to business, then it's probably more on the other side of uh, spectrum, right? Yeah, let's assume you are a startup and your budget is really limited. So you want to deploy a very specific use case. And then you already have a couple of people. You, let's 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 say with no lack of generality, your language is Python, and you have everything. And then, for instance, you would want somebody who will have like deep understanding of underlying algorithm, and will be able to develop a custom solution, and who will be able to put it into broad and ensure that it's not just kind of something that works in the research environment, but kind of runs in real time, is parallelizable, and so on and so forth. So you would expect this person to understand how this works, how this could be parallelizable. But potentially you would also be, if you already have a couple of very, very good software engineers, you would be able, you will be willing to potentially forgive, well, forgive is the wrong word, but kind of accept if this person's potentially coding skills are not at par with those of the professional software engineer. And actually generally for a data scientist, an expectation should not be that they should be an awesome software mm -hmm. engineers because it's not their, the job. I mean, they can be. I have met people who are. I have have a respect for them. To be honest, I'm not one of them, and uh, definitely, unfortunately. But um, unmask because you would also have expectations of kind of very deep understanding of algorithm, what the underlying thing does, and how it basically stems from the data landscape that you have. What kind of data you have to have? You would not expect this person to be tremendous programming they, they can write a lot of their research code and that's okay while well, it's commented mm -hmm. yeah so if you need uh, somebody with strong engineer skills just hire a developer right not a data scientist depends because well, for instance if you have a solution that you need to be able to productionalize mm -hmm. if you need a solution that essentially you know kind of for me for you it would be more important the engineering aspect, then you would look for somebody mm -hmm. who has an understanding of underlying data science methods, but not necessarily so well versed in kind of different underlying algorithms, who has their understanding, but potentially a little bit basic of how the mathematics under the hood works, but then you would need them to really, really be good in programming. It's it's also fine. It depends on it depends on what the business needs. Uh, we have quite a few questions. I know oh. from the questions I prepared, we covered only two out of I don't know how many. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's time we also took a look at uh, the questions um, from sure. the audience. And the first question is from Ilya. So Ilya is asking when AutoML will replace humans and hiring data scientists will not be necessary anymore. Never. Never. <laughs> Why? I <laughs> Well, because of uh, the human aspect, you know, there is a fantastic book, uh, which is called Human and AI, which is written by Accenture's Chief Technology Officer, I think in around 2015. And it talks about the professions of the future. So called, I mean, definitely AI is developing. AutoML is tremendously powerful and it grows its power day by day. And this is good because we also want to. And also, for instance, you know, some kind of also no code environment, such as, for instance, different designers, they're also fantastic because they enable so called citizen data scientists. And this is a very, very right way to go because you will have some of the solutions really robustly tested and safe for a person with no degree in advanced mathematics to be able to safely use for the goals, of, you know, to be able to meet the goals of the business. But you would never. This is what we discussed in the beginning. It, it, it's that data scientists are first and foremost people. You would never be able to re re replace the human in them. And this is why you would always, because you do things for humans essentially. So this is why I think it's never, I think that you would always, it, it is, I'm not like a futurist, but I think it's, uh, you would always need a human in the book. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons, one of the most common reasons that a data science and machine learning project fails is misalignment, miscommunication oh, yes. between different, like between the stakeholders, the product, uh, people from the product, the, the users and the data scientists who implement the solution. So 
you have to have this conversation, you have to have this communication with uh, others in order to do what is the right thing to do, right? And if now you replace <laughs> data scientists who are okay with communication, maybe not the best ones, but okay, with machines who do not communicate at all, who expect clean data, then of course it will not work. You still need communication, right? So AI will not magically solve all the problems of your users. You know, there is certain automation possible for data quality checks as well. So it's not about that. It's what you said about the delivery of a deployment of an AI project or any project. The most important thing is vitamin C, which is a communication. And this right. is not my finding. This I read it in a book. There is a woman from Spain, her name is Araceli Sagarra. And she is the first uh, woman who has climbed Mount Everest. And she wrote a book about this. And she, I, I love this book. And uh, I think one of the things which resonated with me most was essentially she provided examples where lack of vitamin C was leading to outcomes where people literally died going up. So uh, this is pivotal that people communicate really. And this is why I think that you would always, always need people. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, some things you can automate, some things, but AutoML aims at simplifying the work of data scientists, not replacing. Oh yes, them. exactly. So this is essentially you have you have hit the nail on the head. It's simplifying the work that you are doing, because before you would spend a lot of time, you know, trying and testing different algorithms, but then. But then now you have opportunity to kind of have the machine do this for you very, very quickly and then save a lot of your time and energy. But it's the same like before we were all used to wash the dishes by hand and now we all have dishwashers. Yeah, I recently discovered the beauty of having a dishwasher. Really? I didn't know how to start it. Yeah. And uh, we had a dishwasher, we have had it for like eight years. I just didn't know how to turn it on. But recently, uh, so my life will never be the same now because I know how to turn it on now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, an interesting question. Um, so personally, I am good at data science, but my manager wants me to do a course in management, which I feel is not relevant for me since my passion is in data science. So do you have any suggestions um, uh, for people in this situation, like what they yeah. can do to, well, let's say you, you do not want to become a manager, but your your boss is kind of trying to push you a little bit in this direction, saying, hey, we need managers. We want to grow the team. I think it's a vitamin C thing. I think it's to have an honest conversation with your manager and understand basically what, where they are coming from. You know, to understand what are their motivation, why you're pushing you, you know, you to do that, what they want you to do. Because potentially, do they want you to really lead the team? Do they want you to take more responsibility? Uh, and essentially, why you? Because essentially, if you don't want to, you don't have to. That's the thing. Because of uh, the career path of a data scientist is a very, very hot and acute topic. And people expect some kind of blueprints which will be robustly tested in this. And it's not possible because the discipline, especially in the industry, it exists for about like seven years a little bit more maybe, but um, you still don't have enough examples of people who would reach kind of C-level positions. I mean, there are, but they are not as many as you would have potentially in engineering to be able to understand what your options would be. Because of, in many environments, people assume automatically that the only way up is through management. Mm -hmm. And when you start managing, I mean, how my boss likes to say, which I really, really like, quoting he says uh, everybody can be a leader but not everybody can be a manager and you know extending this quote i would say not everybody has to and it's absolutely fine you you don't have to manage people to to be a data science leader because you have also had to understand how also understand one thing there is a certain it's physics it's the law of conservation of energy right so in order to for you to kind of give more to something you would have to take this energy from somewhere else, right? And, and so if you manage people, or if you spend time, for instance, in business meetings on support, I mean, you're less hands-on. 
and you lose touch to technology, you lose touch to, I mean, you practice your craft much less if at all. So it's also something that you have to take into consideration. So it's not just, um, it, it's, it's essentially a matter of what you do in your life, you know? So yeah, yeah, going back to this example, I would have an honest conversation and try to understand where the manager is coming from and then provide an alternative solution by saying, look, potentially if I do this, you will lose a great data scientist because I will kind of lose my, my, my practice. And then are you ready to do this? Are you willing to do this? Does it go well with the goals of organization? Because maybe there is a third solution. You can hire somebody else to be a team lead and let this person to be, you know, kind of advanced as a uh, manager specialist or how, however you call them in your organization, but kind of a senior responsible person for a technology or something like this. So the risk for the company here is to lose a great data scientist, but maybe get a, an average manager, right? Precisely. Okay. So the company should really think about this. And okay, fair enough. Um, how hard would it be to switch from data analysts to from data analyst to data scientist? Depends. <laughs> Uh, depends on uh, like the company where you work or depends on no, what you background. who you call data scientist a definition you have in your head for yeah. data scientist right i guess on your background i mean it also mm -hmm. what kind of data scientist you want to be depends mm -hmm. yeah there are different like there are data scientists who are more leaning towards you know business side of things and then from analytics i think the, the switch is not that difficult right and there are data scientists who are more into envelopes and engineering and then it would require i don't know taking uh, coding classes or something like this right or getting practice as well but also understanding underlying mathematics mm -hmm. yeah right so it depends on how how well versed people are already in this so what will be you can learn anything because we all learned. I mean, this is something which is very, very important. Like what makes a great data science? Great education and then to install the new hours of practice. You know how they say that you have to put, in order to become an expert in something, you have to put this 10,000 hours of practice, give or take. Yeah, one thing I wanted to talk to you about also was uh, one of the things you mentioned when we just uh, started this conversation about uh, inviting you to this podcast. You mentioned that you managed to attract a significant share of excel excellent female candidates, for excellent female talents to your team. Yeah. And I thought about this and I'm also hiring. I'm a part of hiring process. I'm a hiring manager. I also take part in hiring as an interviewer. And I do not see many females in the candidates. So maybe the ratio is 91. So 90% males and only one, uh, one, only 10% females. You don't see so, them here. Sorry. What do you mean by when you say that you don't see them? Yeah, that's uh, when people apply. Mostly it's males. So I'm really curious how you managed to to get a significant share of female candidates uh, okay. and well, female talents. Now I'm going to speak, I guess, on this because it's a very, very <laughs> topic which is very dear to my heart for obvious reasons. And uh, probably I will get open the gates of hell, but you know what, I guess it's the truth and it's, it has to be spoken. <laughs> it's very, very hard. I mean, it's much, it's easier for us now, but it's generally very, very hard for us women in, in, in STEM because the bias against us is systemic. And uh, it's more pronounced in one society and less pronounced in other societies. But if you focus on this uh, a little bit more, and you would see that, for instance, when boys start, you know, kind of developing and growing up, they are almost encouraged and incentivated to go into things such as engineering, you know, or mathematics or physics. Whereas girls are more expected, and it's a social pressure, to prioritize st stuff like liberal arts which is a very honorable discipline and care. But um, there are not too many girls who would choose mathematics. So partially, I mean, I, I, would, I would be absolutely honest. Some, some women just don't care. They're not interested in it, really. And it's all right because some people, you know, they're interested in literature. Some people are interested, you know, in history. Some people are interested in music. It's all right to not care about mathematics or engineering. 
but it has nothing to do with gender, but a lot with the social kind of pressure and the expectation, mm -hmm. and also what kind of people intake from their families, which have also been brought up by generations of people thinking things a certain way. So it's not potentially some one person to be. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. In my group, when I was studying at university, there was only one girl in mm -hmm. a group of 25 people. Mm -hmm. When I started, we had 25% of females, uh -huh. right? Well, and I think what... it was quite a lot. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to say, but then later on, something that happens is also kind of girls, they are, how to say, a little bit overseen. Also, oftentimes, and not all the times, but oftentimes, when they study, because they're not expected to have a certain level of ability or dedication or whatnot. I have not encountered this myself, but I had my friends who told me that they personally have encountered this discrimination, I would say, based on their gender. They would say you would never attain certain heights because you are a woman, directly or indirectly. And uh, also, it becomes increase, increasingly difficult for women when they enter the workforce because there are many biases, such as, for instance, like-like bias. So you would normally unconsciously be prone to like people who are more similar to you because you feel safer around your, let's say broadly, people who, who look like you or who are like you. And this is why if you go to an assessment center or to a company and it's populated with males, that's it. They're going to basically say, yeah, this is a safer choice, unconsciously, with all the best intentions in the world. So if you want to be able to attract diverse talents, basically people who are different from you, you should potentially shift a little bit your mindset and also be more open and be more willing to understand where other people are coming from and then what is important to them. Yeah, and that also applies to, to women, essentially. Another thing which is important to do is knowing, knowing that there are more male than female and the system is skewed towards kind of a male prevalence in, in, in this industry is to apply more effort because of uh, I have seen a lot of people kind of expecting that somebody all out of the blue will source them outstanding female talent and just say, look, you choose. Doesn't really work like this. So you have to be able to go on a limb and go and search for these people. And you go search LinkedIn, you search your weak ties. This is actually one of the best ways because of our, you know, kind of application through reference or hiring through a reference in my experience works really well. Because if you know people who are excellent, chances are the people from their surrounding are also excellent, you know? And then you can just basically ask and say, hey, do you know any excellent female data scientists who are now looking for a job? Because the last very important thing, which is also very important to mention, is that there is a research, and I don't want to sound that I'm against men or anything, I promise you I'm not. But one thing also to say is that there is a research which shows that a woman would apply or feel secure to apply for a job only in, when she takes 100% of the requirement boxes. A male is known to be able to kind of go with it when they take around 60% of boxes, you know. So you would really need to empower, encourage, potentially sometimes convince and help somebody also boost their self-confidence. Because guess what? The self-confidence has been unboosted over generations <laughs> or years. So I mean, like, and, and the technical knowledge and, uh, you know, it's actually brilliant. And then women are also excellent in the kind of, uh, how to say that? In many things, I mean, everybody's every person's a different world. You cannot just basically attribute some qualities to a man or a woman. And I say this with my shallow knowledge of psychology. <laughs> but um, en masse, what I have seen that women are really, really good in organizing work. Excellent. Mm -hmm. You know. And yeah, one of the questions I wanted to ask is how to make job descriptions more attractive to female candidates. I think you partly answered that question is by citing this research that uh, men apply, if women apply when they tick 100% of the boxes, mm -hmm. but men apply when it's 60. So maybe one of the things that we can do is when coming up with a job description, list only the skills that are absolutely necessary, right? So. And I meet all the nice to have ones, right? 
Yeah, I think that's always a good approach, but it's my personal opinion because on the end of the day, regardless of gender or background, you want to hire a person who could do the job really well. There is no such thing as a perfect candidate. You should also be very, very frank with yourself. What do you absolutely need a person to bring with it and what they can learn on the job? And you have to facilitate the resources for them to learn on the job as well. But I guess, yes, you don't want to end up hiring an Eierling in the Wollmilchsau because of it's not sustainable and they're not... Can you remind what it is? It's like a Swiss army knife, right? <laughs> the jack of all trades, yes. Yes, okay. so you, Yeah, so you would want to basically... Uh, my, my, my suggestion is always to boil it down to what you actually need this person to, to, mm -hmm. to know and be able to do. Yeah, I came across a startup uh, or a company. So what they do, they offer is uh, you can upload a CV uh, or job description, sorry. And in this job description, they will highlight things that say that, okay, if you include this word, it will um, like discourage female candidates to apply. Yeah. So you consider replacing it with a different, yeah. like with a synonym. So do you think it works? Like, is it uh, how it actually works? I was quite surprised when I saw this. It was like replacing one synonym by another. And then just say, okay, like if you do this, then you increase chances of getting more female candidates. I think it does. does it I think generally it does, yes, because I believe that there are some wordings which feel more kind of, you know, appealing potentially, mm -hmm. generally. And I would not say, you know, if you just try this and if you rewrite your your uh, job description you would also find it more appealing to men <laughs> because normally it will suggest that you focus on things such as collaboration team spirit you know psychological safety and i don't know i mean the person of any gender who would not like that okay I see we don't have a lot of time left and I know you need to go uh, at yeah. uh, 6.30. So maybe, I don't know if you can answer that quickly, mm -hmm. but maybe you can try. Will you consider a person who has gap of six years while hiring? Yes, why not? Why not? Mm -hmm. Well, because of the gap? Like maybe you think, okay, they don't have uh, the skills that I needed, or at least I, uh, like let's say if I have a gap, I might think this way that uh, the hiring manager would not think I am I have the same level of skills as the person who just graduated from a data science bootcamp or something but or not bootcamp like university or whatever. You know, the reason why people take gaps in their career are very, very different. And oftentimes they have nothing to do with the, uh, their ability to do things. Mm -hmm. I mean, like definitely... kids, for example, right? For women. And not only for women, I mean, for instance, yeah. I know people who are men who have taken yeah. gaps, not Six years. Gap, just to take care of their families because they had to. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is a normal, I mean, life happens. But I don't think that it basically anyhow reflects on their skills. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But can uh, you maybe have a tip um, for them to feel better or more secure when applying? When you have a gap, how can you, uh, you know, feel better about it and then just keep applying? I guess that's what you said it, keep applying and believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing is that I can tell you a lot of encouraging things, but the thing is that it's on everybody to believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. you, you kind of, yeah, it's scary. It's out there. Absolutely. You know, I feel insecure or, or kind of anxious or vulnerable at many times often and frequently because i'm a human being and it's a part of the human experience but in the end of the day you just think okay i already have a no as a baseline what do i have to lose mm -hmm. that somebody basically makes a judgment about my gut it's on them really i don't have mm -hmm. to i don't have to inherit this i don't have to you know kind of absorb that uh, there is a small request for you. Can you type the German word you said? I can't and because I don't know it... where. Because because I you know kind of only have ah, this in chat. Can you have... say it slowly? No, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this in the YouTube um, comment. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> yes, that is all right. So uh, please check the comment section after the call. The word will be there. 
Okay, I think that's all. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks a lot for sharing your expertise with us. We didn't cover most of the questions I prepared, but that's okay, I guess, because <laughs> the conversation we had was really nice. Thanks for asking me questions. This is not something hap that happens quite often. And yeah, um, thanks. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Many thanks, Alexei, for having me. And many thanks everyone for uh, the questions and the comments. I will definitely look at them again. And feel free to post uh, more questions. I will try to answer them offline in, in video. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have a great rest Bye of everyone. the day. You too. Bye. -bye. Bye.